Hey guys, today we are looking at the 12 megapixel turret style security camera from Reolink. It's model number RLC1220A. That's a lot of megapixels for less than $100 American. Let's check it out. Today we're going to do a quick rundown of what's in the box and the specifications of this high megapixel device. We're also going to look at a couple of connectivity options like connecting it to my Reolink NVR and to my home network. And of course, we're going to dive into some daytime and nighttime footage from various locations. Lastly, we're going to do a water test and talk about bandwidth. Let's jump into the box. Starting off here, it looks like we have some paper certifications, a drill template so you know where to drill those screw holes before installing the camera's mounting plate. Here we have a window or a fence sticker make that two wait no it's four actually it's five nice and they're all in different languages for that multilingual thief next we have the user manual and it's available in multiple languages a short network cable which could be used for testing your camera when setting it up before you install it in its permanent location under the foam here we have a weather sealing coupler or gland which protects the rj45 connection from the elements at the bottom of the box, we have some screws and anchor for installing the camera on its mounting surface. Lastly, of course, we have the camera. I'm going to twist off the mounting plate and slide the wires out. I'll slide the mounting plate back on and attach it to the base and secure it with a click. You can see that it's locked into place here pretty good. Now remember, that click is required when installing the camera to know it's attached to the base plate. Once the camera is installed, it can swivel 360 degrees and the camera can also be adjusted within the turret in all directions. I really like this flexibility without having to loosen and tighten hinges and joints like you do with the bolt style camera. I also like the fact that you don't have to open up any domes and risk getting dust inside the device. If your install location doesn't have a hole to accommodate the wires, you will have to feed them through the side using this little slot right here. The mounting plate fits perfectly over this just fine, but keep in mind, now your wires are exposed. There are three leads attached to the camera, an RJ45 connection, where you plug your camera directly into your NVR or into your home network. This port does accept power over Ethernet or PoE, where your PoE switch can provide electricity to the camera over the network cable. The next cable we have is a 12 volt DC connection. This camera does not come with a power adapter, but one could be used if you are unable to take advantage of the PoE port to power the device. The last cable here is a reset button. To reset the camera back to factory defaults, press and hold the button for 10 seconds while powering on the device. This can be done using a power adapter or like I am doing here by plugging in the PoE charge cable while holding down that button. Turning it around, on the back of the camera's metal shell, you'll find a door for the micro SD card. Simply open the watertight door and click in your card. The maximum size for a card here is 256 gigs, which can hold over 72 hours of footage. However, do note that the card only records when motion is detected and not continuously. Just below the camera's lens, we have an environment lighting sensor, which tells the camera to use daytime color mode or black and white nighttime mode with night vision. We'll test that out here shortly. And you'll also notice that there's a small hole just below the lighting sensor, which is the camera's microphone. We're gonna look at that here in a bit as well. Also do note that there is no speaker on this camera, so two-way audio is not an option here. Looking at the camera's lens, it's a fixed five millimeter fixed lens with a horizontal field of view of 67 degrees and a vertical view of 41. The CMOS sensor is 1 over 2.49 inches in size and can stream video up to 20 frames per second at over 8,000 kilobits per second. For a better understanding of what these numbers mean and everything you want to know about security camera lenses, do check out this video. Surrounding the lens, we have the LED night vision lights. They are rated for 30 meters or 100 feet. We'll check that out shortly as well. 
the camera's operating temperature only goes down to minus 10 degrees Celsius or 14 Fahrenheit. At this point, I've used the camera for quite a while outside, and temperature is much lower than that, and I've had no issues whatsoever. Next, we're going to discuss a couple of connectivity options and what is needed to get this camera functional. The first option, and the easier of the two, is connecting the camera to the VioLink NVR. To connect the camera using the supplied network cable, simply plug it into a camera port on the back of the recorder and it will start working automatically and recording footage to the internal hard drive. The camera will now be accessible through the NVR's user interfaces. So the first user interface that we're looking at here is the NVR. We're just waiting for the camera to start up. Now, let's check out the footage using the web user interface by logging in to the NVR. At this point, we want to plug the NVR into our home network, and we also need to get the IP address of the NVR itself. Now on the web user interface, here in Chrome, I'll enter that IP address and log in using an empty password. And that's it, we're in. You'll probably notice that those studio lights are pretty bright on my face. Moving on to the PC app, by default, Reolink adds connected cameras automatically, so no action is required by me. Now lastly, we're using the iPhone app here. Again, the camera is automatically added. So that's four user interfaces, all hooked up and running, just by plugging in the camera. Connecting the camera to the NVR couldn't be simpler, and that means that when I want to expand my system down the road, it's going to be very easy. The last note I like to make about this option is you cannot access this camera using third-party camera management software tools when it's protected behind the NVR. All right guys, so I factory reset the camera to demonstrate this next option to get the camera up and running. It's the standalone method. All you're going to need is the camera and a way to power the device. This could be using a power adapter or a PoE switch. Here I'm going to use the PoE switch, which is connected to my home network. I'll add links for the adapter and a recommended PoE switch in the description below. My iPhone is on the same home network as my switch and camera, and when I open up the RioLink app, I can see the uninitialized device. Let's get that activated. Add the credentials. In our first option, when we connected the camera to the NVR, the NVR took care of this step. If you were wondering why we didn't have to go through these steps when we connected the camera to the NVR. Now give it a name, and now we should be able to access the live feed. There I am. So now that the camera is activated, this might be all you need for your surveillance system. Nothing else is required. It's a very basic security camera setup. So now you can access your camera anywhere using the RioLink app and even playback footage when motion is detected through the micro SD card that's already installed. Now, just like we saw using the NVR, you can still access the camera using your web browser on your computer or the RioLink PC app. Now, in addition to using the standalone option, you can use a third-party camera management program like Blue Iris to record and playback footage. This is my go-to software, and I'll add a link to the uh, in the description below if you're interested in checking out the evaluation version. Let's get that camera added. Now, first of all, you're going to need the IP address of the camera on your network. Not the camera on your NVR, but the camera on your network. And you can see mine right here, .141. Now here in Blue Iris, I'll add the camera using the IP address. I'm going to skim over this here pretty quick. Enter your credentials and select Real Link and remove this part of the mainstream address. Going to the record tab, I'm going to set this to record 24 seven. Here on the video tab, there is an image format size. If you leave this as is, the camera is going to display in its native four x three. Let me show you. See how the image is a little squat? Let's jump back here into the settings and set that size to 3840 by 2160. That looks much better and it fills the screen nicely. Here's a quick look at a side-by-side -side comparison of the two. 
Now just as a side note, when you export the footage from the camera or from the NVR or using Blue Iris, it does retain that 4x3 ratio. I also noticed that Blue Iris did drop a few frames and I got some unexpected glitching happening with Blue Iris. It's normally my go-to software, but in this case, I feel that the NVR handles it much better because I had no drop frames and no glitches whatsoever. The first location we're going to be looking at here is on my back deck, looking out onto the empty field. The daytime footage looks perfect. Great colors, nice vibrant sky. Let's fast forward and uh, I'll set up these markers here so I have an idea of how far I am away from the camera so we can do some good testing. If I zoom in digitally, let's have a look at the details at 300 feet. Now let's walk towards the camera. Here we are at 200 feet, now at 150 feet, 100. Now the shadow on my face does make it a little difficult to see the details and to identify who I am, but that's expected on a bright sunny day like this. At 75, 50, and 25. Here are some samples of nighttime footage. So here we are outside and I'll turn on the IR light in the camera and I'll start here at the 25 foot marker and walk towards the 300 foot marker. Now we're at 50. Seventy-five, and I'm hardly visible. Now at 100. 150. 200. 250. 300. So as expected, the limit here for the night vision lights is about 50 to 75 feet in a situation like this where there's no ambient light. Now if there were street lights on or other lights around, the visibility would be farther. For our next test location, we're going to place the camera here temporarily over the back door. I have the camera mounted onto a pole near the ceiling to get a good sample of the footage if I were to install the camera in this location. Again, the daytime footage looks awesome good detail and this camera provides good coverage for this area. I like the 5mm lens here in this location. And let's do a sample of the audio. This is a sound test from 20 feet away. And this is a sound test from 10 feet away. And here is a quick look at some nighttime footage. So here we are in black and white mode and I've got my deck lights turned on. So let's turn those, uh, let's turn it to uh, color mode. And since these lights will always be on when it's dark out, I'm comfortable leaving it in uh, color mode. So the uh, dead lights are turned off. Let's uh, have a look of how this would be in color. So yeah, not, uh, not very good in color mode. So yeah, I'll be leaving the camera in color mode since my dawn to dusk house lights will always be providing enough light for this situation. I really like this feature in the app where you can force the camera to go into color mode even though it wants to do, uh, wants to do black and white in this situation. All right, so let's, uh, let's do a quick star test. I really like looking at the stars and recording any type of nighttime events like fireballs or meteors or northern lights. Let's point the camera towards the sky and record 24 hours of footage. I'm actually really impressed with how little noise or grain that was produced at night and the overall quality was much better than expected. I was kind of thinking that a few stars might shine through and there would be ghosting, but no, you can actually see stars really well. This is awesome. Now before we move on, I was actually lucky enough to capture some northern lights with this camera a few days later. The footage starts here on a cloudy evening and then we have some auroras starting to shine through and eventually the clouds burn off. Since the camera is in nighttime mode in black and white, we didn't capture any color. I did try switching the camera over to color mode for a minute, but the auroras were not bright enough to be captured by this camera. Nonetheless, pretty impressive. Lastly, let's check out the fourth location, which is going to be the new home, the new permanent location for this camera. 
In this situation, I'm going to replace this old 3 megapixel camera with this brand new 12 megapixel one. I'm going to be installing it here on the soffit. I get this question a lot, is the soffit strong enough to support the camera? The answer is yes, I have aluminum soffit here and the cameras have never moved or vibrated in the past seven years. They're screwed into the metal and in this scenario here, I've never needed additional support in the back of the soffit to support these lightweight cameras. Now, as you can see, there is a downlight or a floodlight here. Installing any security cameras near floodlights can destroy your nighttime shot. Let me show you. I placed the camera here on a tripod and positioned it just in front of the light. When the light turns on at night, it will shine directly on the camera's lens and just watch what happens. And here we are at daytime. And then all of a sudden when it gets dark and the image is destroyed, it's just tons of glare and the image is pretty much useless. I'm now gonna turn off the house lights and just watch, the glare is gone. So if you're unsure if your cameras will be impacted by other lights, do a test like I have done to prove it out before installing the cameras permanently. Make sure that all nearby lights don't shine directly on the camera lenses or you could have issues. This will be my fifth outdoor turret install. I'm starting to see the advantages of using this type over the dome in the outdoor environment. But we're gonna save that for a future video. Let's time lapse this install where the house light is actually gonna be shining on the back of the camera and will not impact the image with a glare. Now let's jump into the camera and do some testing. When I start off here, the trees are at 100 feet. And here I make my first stop at 75 feet. The license plate isn't readable until I hit 50 feet, which is not too bad. I was hoping for better detail at a farther distance, but still not bad. When I get closer, obviously, the details become crystal clear. So now we're going to do the test again at night in total darkness with the exception of the camera's own LED night vision lights. The license plate reflective surface is preventing us from seeing much detail here. And it's about at the 25 foot mark where facial features become recognizable. And this is 10 feet away. During the testing phase of this camera, it was nice and windy out. I just wanted to demonstrate the stability of the camera when it's attached to my soffit on such a windy day. No movement from the camera whatsoever. Okay, time to go back inside. So now with the help of my garden hose, let's do a quick water test to make sure there are no issues with this camera and that it is totally waterproof. survived this torrent of rain just fine. One last thing we didn't touch on yet was how much bandwidth and space this high megapixel camera consumes. Here is a live look at the bandwidth. We are seeing about 1 meg per second with H.264 streaming. I have a gigabit network and this means that one 12 megapixel camera consumes about one of the 1000 megs available or 0.1%. For disk space, we are looking at about 3600 megs per hour or 86 gigs per day for one 12 megapixel camera. That means a one terabyte drive can hold just over 11 days of continuous recording. The last additional consideration is CPU and RAM if you're using Blue Iris as your camera management system. Processing the footage from these large megapixel cameras will soak up more resources, but you can alleviate some of that pain by following some of the simple performance tips I outlined in this video right here. All right, guys, I hope that you found this video helpful in knowing what to expect with this camera. My recommendation is to use the camera with the Reolink NVR. It's super easy, plug and play, and the NVR can handle the extra megapixels with no issue. The camera performed excellent during the day and was better than I thought it would be at night. We saw no issues with the water test and it's holding up very well right now in the cold Canadian winter. As always, please like and subscribe, which really does help with the growth of this channel. And links for the camera, NVR, adapter, and PoE switch can be found in the description below. Thanks for watching.